going on a little field trip. Where? Harding, Silence, and Roswell again. The name of the game is Control the Narrative. The world needs to know what's really going on. I've seen too much. I've got to get to the bottom of this. The brand new series of Project Blue Book, Thursdays at 2200 on epic drama. This is my first season on Project Blue Book. I was invited to the party by Jack Rapke, Jackie Levine, and Robert Zemeckis, who I'd worked on a film project with. I was introduced to Sean Jablonski and David early in this year. I was actually working on the episode 100 of American Horror Story, and they came down to the set and they said, hey, you know, we really want you to do this giant finale for us. And, I said, that sounds really fun. What is it? And they said, well, in 1953, the United States went on this, like, lost leader of an of a operation called Operation Mind Brace. And so Operation Mind Brace was when all of NATO, for the first time, exercised this concept of being prepared for war with Russia in the Cold War. So they said, during Operation Mind Brace, there was a UFO sighting that all these countries saw. It's actually well documented. So your episode is going to take place on the USS Wisconsin out in the Barents Sea, and you're going to bring our guys there right after that UFO sighting. I'm like, wow, that's awesome. So are we going to the Barents Sea? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, how much did you prepare for, in, in terms of knowledge, in terms of reading about, mm -hmm. I don't know, UFOs, watching the first season? Mm. What was your uh, preparation for me is everything in telling any story of any scale uh, for any medium. It's all about having a grand understanding of the material and trying to find a way to elevate it and make it visually compelling and also super exciting. So coming into Project Blue Book, the first thing I did was watch the first season, got to know the characters, got to know Dr. Hynek, did a lot of research on Dr. Hynek, found out, found out who he was, read the f second season, so I was all caught up on the nine episodes that were leading up to the finale, and had an understanding of what the trajectory was for the season, both for the Doctor and Quinn, but also for Laura and, of course, Susie, who played big roles, so Mimi and Susie, sorry. Yeah. Um, so in terms of research, I read all the material, I looked at all the episodes, and of course I kind of revisited great films like Robert Zemeckis' Contact, Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind, uh, Arrival, you know, the great Denny Villeneuve movie uh, yeah. that was made a couple of years ago, and I kind of looked at what was being done, you know, across the board cinematically in terms of this type of a project, and I was reinforced with this kind of concept of like, you know, as long as this looks like a movie and it feels big... Let's go wild. Uh, let's go crazy, yeah, <laughs> have fun, exactly. <laughs> The name of the game is control the narrative. If the government is covering up the existence of flying saucers, then you and I are in the best position to expose that truth. We're about to enter the most highly restricted military test site in America. Welcome to Area 51. The world needs to know what's really going on here. You've seen how far the government will go. They cover their secrets. They could ruin you. My name's Kent O'Connor. I'm one of the visual effects supervisors on the show. Uh, and so what I do is I facilitate the execution of visual effects shots on set. Uh, and I help the director come up with uh, cool ways to um, implement his ideas, his or her ideas. Well, there's a lot that we can do in visual effects. There's some things that we can't do, uh, and some things that with very simple changes can make something go from very expensive to um, somewhat less expensive, uh, because there are a lot of things that we do that, you know, that involve a lot of work on the back end. Uh, and so I'm just there to make sure that uh, we do things the most efficient possible way. It's a show about, about aliens and about uh, UFOs, so there are some pretty cool things that we get to do, and, um, and this year in particular, I think over last year, there's some stuff that uh, we're very excited about showing. There was another crash? No, no, there was no crash. That's why we're here. It's all a hoax. So if anyone tries to report uh, What do you mean a hoax? Well, it's under investigation, which means that for now, should anything get broadcast without prior Air Force authorization, it would be a national security issue. Totally understand whatever the Air Force wants. Don't want to lose my license again. How was it working with um, the actors, I guess, the four mm. mm. Aiden, Michael, Lara, and Ksenia. Incredible. Absolutely delightful people that are passionate about their characters 
and about life. These are all really, really good people that are very collaborative, and they're excited and inspired to be on the show. So working with Aiden, who knows this character, Dr. Hynek, so well, is a dream for me, as I kind of always wanted Littlefinger to take over the throne, you know, in Game of Thrones. So I really wanted to work with Aiden because I really like Littlefinger and I really like his character, Dr. Hynek. So coming into that collaboration, you know, he's a real actor's actor, so he's constantly open to direction and interested in how he might elevate his own craft. So he wants to do more prep with the filmmaker. So I felt really special to collaborate with our dear friend Aiden. Michael Malarkey, same thing. Like he really digs in. He like wants to grow, you know, not only as a, as a person, but as a, as a performer. And so he's constantly pushing the story. And I feel a little bit of a director in Michael Malarkey. I feel it. Like, cause he's like, wouldn't I be, or shouldn't I do, or couldn't it be better? And that, I love that about that. Cause anytime you go into a scene with two characters that are always together, when one of them is constantly saying, couldn't this be better if, that's what I'm saying. So then the, when we, all three of us do that couldn't be better if, then we get something spectacular. So that's super cool. You know, Laura is kind of a quiet person when you first meet her. And, and her character is going through like extraordinary changes and feelings and emotions of isolation, of loss, of love, of camaraderie, you know, with her husband. And, and she's got this whole journey that she has that's both centered around herself, but also like their relationship. And, and it's really special to see how much work Laura puts into that. She does and she cares. Uh, Ksenia, who, uh, who's Greek, you know, she uh, kind of is unassumingly good. You know, she's very humble, kind of quiet. And, you know, she listens and takes direction, but she comes in really well prepared. And we only had one day together, but she knocked it out of the park. Her and Laura had these great scenes together. What's happening? We're going down. Brace yourself, Doc. What the hell are you doing up there in the first place? Testing a theory. I don't need you disproving a theory. I need you to write reports and close cases. And if you can't, I'll find someone else who can. How long does it take you, your work, like when you work on a, on a, on a scene or on a character, um, in order to, to make it, to finalize it? Because I don't think a lot of people realize how much work you guys put into it. Right, so on, on any given shot, it, it, there's a quite a broad spectrum of, of time investment that it takes. I mean, it can, it can take anywhere from half a day to do a shot, that's something relatively simple, to up to weeks to get it right. Uh, and so there's a lot of a lot of input that goes into to making it um, to making it look cool, basically. We have about 40 artists that we brought in um, to do the work on the back end, uh, and we have uh, a couple other support staff. So there are about 50 people in total. How much does uh, a director listen to you guys? <laughs> that's that's a very good question. Uh, on Project Blue Book, um, quite a lot, and uh, and and. We have very open dialogue about um, about shots and about their ideas and about some of you know our ideas and how we can help uh, you know bring some ideas together uh, and make them better because of it. And the directors on on the show have been very collaborative, and it, it, the show benefits from that. Uh, and not all directors are as open to hearing about your ideas or about your changes that you'd like to make. Um, uh, for our benefit, um, that's not always the case. For you, as a director, mm -hmm. first of all, why did you decide to, to do that as a job? Mm -hmm. And what's the most important thing in mm -hmm. that job for you? I guess when I was a kid, I thought it would be really cool to make people feel something. And that began, this is gonna sound really strange, but like that, that began first for me as a very young kid going to church with my mother and I would listen to like the preachers kind of talk to the entire church audience and they would really get inspired by that. And that second church for me was really Sundays with my dad at the movie theater. And I grew up with three younger brothers and the four of us would kind of get taken out of the house to leave mom alone for a little bit. And he would take us to the movies. And when we would go there, I, I just really felt better about myself. If I watched Superman, I felt like a fly. If I watched Raiders of the Lost Ark, I felt like I could be an archeologist. If it was Top Gun, I could fly a plane. And I was like, I want to make people feel like that. And I want to move them to be inspired in life. So. Why, why become a director? Because I wanted to be able to speak to the most people I possibly could and make them feel better, excited, scared. I do a lot of scary stuff. 
Um, I, I like I like to give people thrills, uh, and I like to make people laugh. You know, I've, I've been fortunate enough as a filmmaker to do all of those things and work with incredible, incredible actors. So, why? Because ultimately, I just want to move people to love life. I do because I'm in visual effects. I do a lot of superhero and alien shows, um, and so this is kind of familiar territory for me. Uh, but I usually work on on feature films, so. Uh, uh, yeah, I've, I've been fortunate to work on some cool stuff with uh, over the last couple of years. Um, I did Sonic the Hedgehog. Um, uh, that one was a fun project. Um, and uh, I worked on Ultra Cover for Netflix, um, which is a cool, big, big universe show. Um, which, actually, I mean, if I was to compare the two, the episode that we're working on right now feels quite a bit bigger than a lot of the Altered Carbon universe, uh, okay. and which is pretty impressive because it's a it's a big show. So would you say a period piece is more interesting than a pure science fiction? Uh, they definitely have different um, different problems that need to be solved, and that's a lot of what I do is kind of creative problem solving within the universe of the show, um, and uh, it's very different. I like the period piece stuff because it, it really transports the audience to something that's familiar but has a cool somehow scientific or sci-fi uh, um, aspect to it and so that's it's fun to try to blend the the genres like that last question is do you believe in ufos <laughs> i believe in the existence of unidentified flying objects yes i'm sorry you have what unidentified flying object this is a new science we're creating here. It needs its own terminology. I think I can actually identify what it is full of stuff. 